thank you very much, uh, John, and my my dear colleagues. These guys are, are my true friends, not only from Nuremberg, from all the years since, and I I really love them. They are dedicated men. They really believe in the rule of law, and uh, I'm honored to be gathered here, to be here in their company. Now, during World War II, leaders of the Axis powers were repeatedly warned against the commission of acts of cruelty and barbarism. On December 17, 1942, the Allies took note of pogroms against the Jews and condemned in the strongest possible terms this bestial policy of cold-blooded extermination, reaffirming their solemn resolution to ensure that those responsible for these crimes shall not escape a retribution. The crimes having continued so far as could be ascertained from behind the battle lines, on March 24, 1944, President Franklin Roosevelt declared, in one of the blackest crimes of all history, begun by the Nazis in the days of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. It is therefore fitting that we should again proclaim our determination that none who participate in these acts of savagery shall go unpunished. At the close of the war in Europe, the major victorious powers, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union agreed to bring to trial the leaders of the Axis powers responsible for initiating World War II and the commission of con competent crimes. By the London Agreement of August 8, 1945, the International Military Tribunal was established with jurisdiction over crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, namely the extermination or other inhumane treatment of civilian populations in connection with other crimes within the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Following the adoption of the tri charter of the tribunal, an indictment was prepared charging 24 leaders of Nazi Germany with the commission of crimes within the tribunal's uh, jurisdiction. The comprehensive judgment of the tribunal made no explicit mention of genocide, confining its description of murder and ill treatment of civilian populations to the language of the charter. Genocide as such was not declared to be a crime in international law by the IMT, but genocide as a legal principle was affirmed by the General Assembly of the United Nations in its resolution of December 8, 1945, when it defined genocide as the denial of the right of existence of entire human groups, as homicide is the denial of the right to live of individual uh, human beings. Genocide today is a recognized and affirmed crime in international law through both the Genocide Convention and the statute of the International Criminal Court. Its recognition is a result in principal part of the evidence we assembled at Nuremberg. The subject was covered at length in my book, Tyranny on Trial, but I have more recent, recently written a volume on the incredible genocide by the uh, Nazis at Auschwitz entitled Murder by the Millions which is published by the Jackson Center, and it was this Nazi Holocaust which assured the universal recognition of genocide as a crime in international law. Now in the Nazi system, the principal repressive agencies, the Gestapo and the SD, had 
been combined with the Nazi intelligence system within the Reich Main Security Office, or RSHA. Justice Jackson's Executive Trial Counsel, Colonel Robert G. Story, directed me to prepare the case against the Gestapo and SD and the Chief of the Reich Main Security Office, Ernst Kaltenbrunner. I was provided an office in the frigid Palace of Justice, a German secretary, a second-hand typewriter, and told to find the evidence, write the briefs, and assemble the proofs for this aspect of the case. Shortly after I had been given this assignment, I found an interesting letter in our document room. It had been written by a man named Becker to Walter Rauch, the head of the Motor Vehicles Department of the Gestapo. In his letter, Becker complained about the malfunctioning of a gas van he was operating in the Eastern Territories. It was written from an Einsatz commando. At that time, I knew nothing about Einsatz commandos or criminal activities of the Gestapo and SD on the Eastern Front. While working on the Kaltenbrunner case, I learned that British intelligence had taken prisoner a man by the name of Otto Ohlendorf and had him under interrogation in London. Ohlendorf was the head of OMP 3 of the RSHA, which dealt with matters of intelligence within Germany. I had no idea that he might be able to shed light on war crimes, but I thought it would be useful to bring him to Nuremberg where I could learn more uh, from him about the organization of which Kaltenbrunner, uh, mighty defendant, was the chief. The British sent him to Nuremberg, and I began the interrogation by asking him what his activities had been during the war. He said that he had served as chief of OMP 3 of the RSHA, except for the year of 1941. Naturally, I asked what he had done during that year, when he replied that in 1941, he had been in command of Einsatzgruppe D. I immediately recalled the Becker letter which had been written from an Einsatz commando and was inspired to ask, well, Ohlendorf, how many men, women, and children did your group kill during that year? And he answered, 90,000. That broke the case on the extermination program of the Einsatzgruppen in the Eastern Territories and we were able to establish through the testimony of Ohlendorf and others that approximately two million persons, namely Jews, had been murdered by these units of the RSHA. It was the initial proof of the Holocaust, genocide uh, by Germany. Ohlendorf testified before the IMT that he knew of Becker and Rauch and that the Becker letter uh, was genuine. The Soviet member of the tribunal, General Nikochenko, asked the following questions of Ohlendorf. Question. In your testimony, you said that the Einsatzgruppen had the object of annihilating the Jews and commissars. Is that correct? Answer. Yes. Question. And in what category did you consider the children? For what reason were the children exterminated? Answer, the order was that the Jewish population should be totally exterminated. Question, including children? Answer, yes. In my book, Tyranny on Trial, uh, a diagram is displayed containing a report by Stolliker, the chief of Einsatz Group A, showing the number of Jews exterminated in the Baltic states, each number encased in the diagram of a coffin. The report stated that in the first four months of operations, Einsatzgruppe A 
had murdered 135,000 communists and Jews. Estonia was shown as already a Judenfrei, free of Jews. By the time we had rested our case, we had not found the greatest killer of the regime, Rudolf Hirsch, the commandant of Auschwitz concentration camp. It was therefore a dramatic moment when I was informed that Hearst had been captured by the British near Flensburg. I asked that he be sent to Nuremberg where I interrogated him over a period of three days, reducing his testimony to an affidavit. Hearst told me and later testified to the tribunal in open court that approximately two and a half million persons had been murdered at Auschwitz. Upon completion of his testimony, he was turned over to the Polish government. While awaiting trial in Poland, Hearst recanted his confession in part, stating that the figure he had given me had been supplied by Gestapo Chief Eichmann and that he regarded the total of two and a half million as far too high. Even Auschwitz had limits to its destructive possibilities, he wrote. Perhaps the figure was inflated. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial estimates that slightly over a million Jews, a million Jews, were killed at Auschwitz. In addition, gypsies, Soviet POWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others were consumed in the inferno. There may have been a macabre twist to Hearst's testimony, since he was to be labeled the world's supreme murderer. In any case, he may have thought in his morbid mind to establish a record of mass killings never to be surpassed by any other man. This seems a reasonable supposition when it is remembered that Eichmann had said that he would jump laughing into his grave, remembering the killing of six million Jews of Europe. Hitler and his Confederates who led Germany to disaster in the 20th century are all dead. They were the principal actors in a fearsome drama, but as Prospero foretold, they were all spirits and belted into air, into thin air. The tyrant Hitler and his associates in crime will someday be forgotten. Forgotten too may be their crimes. It is enough that tomorrow's world remembers what today's world has learned through the bitter experience of this fallen regime, that tyranny leads to inhumanity and inhumanity to death. The spirit of Hitlerism was one of the greatest factors for evil in all of history. For Hitler had the advantage over tyrants of earlier times, of modern technology, through which his propaganda could be constantly pounded into the German people, and his war machine could be made to strike his enemies with shattering force. The consequence of that spirit was the commission of genocide and other crimes against humanity, which stagger comprehension. After hearing the confession of Rudolf Hearst to the Nuremberg Tribunal, the defendant Hans Frank, the governor general of occupied Poland, declared that was the low point of the entire trial. To hear a man say out of his own mouth that he exterminated two and a half million people in cold blood, that is something people will talk about for a thousand years. We must have an effective system of international justice crowning our national systems of law. Our scientists have not feared to make thermonuclear weapons 
which could destroy civilization. Certainly, we should not fear to establish the principles of law which will permit civilization to survive. We must find the way to make law supreme in international relations, or we shall live forever under a pall of fear. Nuremberg stands firmly against the resignation of man to the inhumanity of man. Because of Nuremberg and the efforts which it represents of men's attempt to elevate justice and law over inhumanity and war, there is a hope for a better tomorrow. speech in terms of my personal experience, uh, incident to going to Nuremberg, in an endeavor to try to set a, path, a uh, model for other people in the future. Uh, my philosophy is that uh, you can either stumble ahead, one foot ahead of the other in life, or you can keep your eyes on the stars. You can dream dreams of a better world. You can tithe for humanity. And uh, I learned that uh, from my father and also at Nuremberg. Uh, in, in 1946, 1945, I'm sorry, uh, I just graduated from the Yale Law School. I was a very good student there and sought after by every law firm there was. And uh, suddenly began working in the uh, caverns of Wall Street. And uh, I never saw my wife, so we agreed to have dinner every Wednesday night at Schraff's at 6 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, what do you do all day? She said, I can't tell you. I said, well, I'm your husband, it's theoretically at least. Uh, <laughs> uh, she said, you heard what I said. Uh, it developed, she was working on the atom bomb, which was dropped at uh, Hiroshima, at SAM Labs. Uh, she said, what do you do all day? <laughs> well, every afternoon at two o'clock, I go to the Chase Bank I review corporate trust department documents, and uh, I work hard, and uh, sometimes I work late at night. She said, my God, there's a world out there. We ought to be part of it. It wasn't long thereafter, I got very restless, so I agreed to go with a small firm, and a smaller firm. And uh, uh, Ted Fensemacher, uh, was a classmate of mine at Yale. And uh, I had a, an opportunity for a partnership, although I was very young, very young at the time, because I'd done the law school in two years instead of three. And uh, so I invited him out for a nice roast pork dinner. And uh, I made my announcement, and he said nothing. Afterwards, he said, Henry, I hate to upstage you, but I'm joining the U.S. prosecution staff at Nuremberg. Well, my wife wouldn't let me get to bed that night. Uh, I never got a no moment's sleep, and the following day I was on the steps of the Pentagon. Uh, everybody who I knew, all the dear friends, said that you're giving up a sure partnership on Wall Street which I didn't agree with, but they thought I, I was a sure thing. At the same time, when you get back, there'll be no job. You'll have insecurity. The veterans will be here. You'll, they'll have priority. You'll be out on the street. But uh, I prodded by my wife, who had a needle in my back. Uh, I, she, uh, I, I, I set sail for Nuremberg. 
And I arrived in Nuremberg in March of 46 in a blinding rainstorm. Walked across the uh, Grand Hotel, which was be my home, and uh, for a year and a half there. And uh, didn't sleep that much that night, but following morning, I walked through the ruins of Nuremberg. And there was nobody there. No human beings there. There were a few old women with shawls, black shawls, depressing, and no food. And I said, uh, as I walked to the courthouse for the first time, I'm going to dedicate my life to the prevention of this. And uh, I since have done, dedicated my life to it. Got at the courthouse. I had no supervision whatsoever. They said prepare cases against von Brockitsch, who was commander in chief of the German army, Guderian, who was uh, uh, chief of the staff of the German army, and Erhard Milch, who was head of the German Air Force in, under Goering. But uh, I just, Nuremberg was geared to self starters. And if anything, I am a self starter. And I didn't like supervision anyway. I had too many, I had too many layers of supervision in the middle Millbank firm. There was a junior partner and a junior and a senior associate and this and that. And by the time anything got done, it had been watered down, so it didn't mean as much as I wanted to mean. So there's certain satisfaction. But when I saw the crimes, I worked on the human experiments case, saw what Dr. Rasher had done at uh, Dachau concentration camp. I, I saw the slave laborers. We had witnesses from the slave labor, which was the largest slaving operation in history. Nothing even remotely like it. And uh, I also met some of the defendants uh, with Hermann Goering. Uh, he was very entertaining to talk to. He, he was quite a raconteur. And uh, for some reason, it was a Saturday afternoon, the last time I saw him on September 28, 1946. Uh, we spent a couple of hours hearing about the gossip between Hitler and Gianno, who he hated, the Italian foreign minister and minister. Italy, son, uh, Mussolini's son-in-law, and uh, Hitler. But he was an unconstruct, recon, uh, unconstructed, uh, uh, he was not a reconstructed Nazi. He was a person who believed that Hitler would come back, that there would be a return in 60 years. But I also met Albert Speer, who was the uh, Minister of War Production, whom I wrote a book about. and. Uh, uh, I had prepared a case against Erhard Milch, who was uh, a chairman with Speer, the leader of the Central Planning Board, which governs Germany's economy in wartime. And uh, I tried to get tes uh, testimony against uh, Milch from Speer. Uh, he didn't have any uh, uh, testimony he wanted to give me. He said, I'm responsible. I was the chairman of the Central Planning Board. I take responsibility for it. So I've got a dry hole. In other words, in the oil industry, that's bad. So I had to make conversations with him. And uh, so what happened was that uh, I saw that he was drawing a picture of a woman with a black shawl uh, sitting on a park bench uh, looking into a dark sky. I said, who's that? Uh, picture of, he says, it's my mother. I said, why is she so depressed? He says, because I'm here. So uh, I told him that uh, I thought the painting was very good. My mother was an artist, and uh, so was my mother-in-law. And uh, he's, I, I got talking with him, and I said, you were the one who influenced Hitler more than anybody else. And I said, how did you do it? He said, well, every Wednesday night, I took the night plane about 7 p.m. from Temple off Aerodrome, and I re re pre-dialogued my conversations with Hitler. And uh, I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, let me give you an example. Uh, Bormann, who was a party chief, wanted to destroy all the ins industrial installations in the Low Countries. 
and in uh, France, and he, I didn't want it. And uh, so on the way down from the Temple of Airdrome to Berchtesgaden, where I had a meeting with Hitler, I, I, did, I con conceived of a plan for handling the meeting and for destroying Bormann's objective. When I got down there, per my pre-rehearsal, pre I, I told Hitler, you have this directory, which directive, which Bormann has asked you to sign. You don't want to sign that. We're coming back. You told us we're coming back. And Hitler rep, ripped up the directive. So um, Spare intrigued me a great deal. Uh, he was the only one who pleaded guilty. He said, I'm responsible. He's certainly no hero. He did some terrible things. But uh, I learned a lot at Nuremberg and uh, uh, through uh, Spare and many other people, well, particularly on the prosecution staff. So I get back from Nuremberg, uh, served my time. Like Milch got a life sentence. He was the head of the Air Force for slave labor, and he was not convicted on human experiments. But I got back and uh, with a good record from Yale Law School, which at that time was the top law school, which it still is. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure my friend next to me would disagree with that. I, I had to look for a job. And I found that the bar was, uh, had a lot of misconceptions of Nuremberg. That uh, they were worried about the ex post facto element of Nuremberg. And I had trouble, given my academic record, getting a job. But I finally succeeded. And since that time, I've been carrying the torch ever since through first the United World Federalists, and then the American Bar Association, where I was cha chairman of the section of international law, and um, through other activities. But what I'm saying is this that I'm in the autumn of my life, perhaps the late autumn, I don't know, although uh, I hopefully uh, have a few years left. But as I look on it, Nuremberg was the most meaningful part of my life. And I don't say this in a selfish sense, but we have to sell young people on the idea that it's the substance it's the concern of your future persons that are going to be here on the planet. It's concern of a world in which weapons don't destroy man. We want men to control weapons. That's the important thing. Again, back to my first premise, I think you've got to keep your eyes on, your star, on the stars and you live on hopes and let's keep that ideal in the future. We have a special responsibility because we're a free society and a society where dreams can become a reality. We have the American dream, which becomes a reality in the business world. Let the American dream become a reality in the international political world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry King. Benjamin Ferenz. Thank you very much, uh, John, for the introduction. John himself is a great expert on uh, Justice Jackson and knows all about of his plans and dreams and has written about it and will continue to write about it. You've heard the very dramatic reading and presentation by our friend uh, Whitney Harris. Uh, I have found in my own experience that numbers mean very little to an audience. What does it mean? A million people killed, two million people killed. The story of Anne Frank, everybody knows. But who were among the millions? And how many fathers and how many children and so on? Uh, it's a little too grim. Henry has told you the inspiring story of how he was saved from Wall Street by going to suffer, <laughs> <laughs> suffer in the Grand Hotel where he's reported that the whiskey was 50 cents a bottle or something like that. Not exactly Washington crossing the Delaware, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> a 
but in fact, you know, we had no idea at that time that we would be sitting 60 years later and discussing it. I'm sure that none of us would have dreamt that that was at all possible. So what I will try to do in the few minutes before we open the floor for questions is look at what you have heard so far in this conference and my compliments to the organizers, Greg Peterson and all the sponsors, the American Society of International Law, which sent us two of their great stars to join in the discussions here, um, and the others, uh, to take a, an overall perspective of what it's all about. And uh, most of you, I'm sure, have heard about how difficult it is in the various tribunals and the difficulties with the statutes and the interpretation of uh, various provisions and all that, uh, all of which is correct if you are a technician or an expert on it. But I'd like to take a step back and uh, take another view of it. Let me follow Henry's lead first by telling you how I got involved in this business. I was a graduate of a very good law school, Harvard, <laughs> uh, and no sooner had that event occurred when the army immediately recognized my talent and <laughs> they made me a private in the artillery. <laughs> well, in that capacity, you see, my respect for the army's perception has been shaken a bit. In that capacity, I landed on the beaches of Normandy, chased the Germans halfway to Berlin, went through all the battles, and uh, when the war was over, I had reached the exalted status of a sergeant of infantry. I got an honorable discharge and five battle stars for having participated in all the leading battles and not having been killed or wounded, which I thought was a very good idea. <laughs> I'm not sure whether the bullets went over my head or whether I was just lucky, but... <laughs> In any case, my experiences were a bit different. Uh, Whitney here had served as a line officer in the Navy. Uh, at, as we got into Germany, we began getting reports of atrocities, and I was reassigned from the artillery to General Patton's headquarters as a war crimes investigator. Uh, in that capacity, I won't go into the gory details or the statistics at this point. Um, I was with the liberating forces in all the concentration camps liberated by General Patton's army. Uh, Buchenwald, Mauthausen, Evensee, names which no longer mean anything to a new generation. But there, I personally witnessed the horrors of the camps uh, as they were being liberated. Total chaos. The inmates dying, lying on the ground, and chasing the guards, the guards trying to flee, guards being caught, being beaten to death, burned alive, all of that. I won't go into it, but I was a personal witness to all of that uh, in its most horrible form, in action. Uh, it was not just a statistic for me, it was much more than that. I stayed on in Germany after that, after the trials. Uh, let me tell you a bit about it because I'm indebted to Whitney here for having interviewed Otto Ohlendorf and obtained from him uh, an SS general uh, the confession that the unit under his direct command had killed 90,000 Jews. And uh, I became the chief prosecutor in that trial, the Einsatzgruppen trial, because we had found the other documents, the daily reports from the front, saying specifically which unit entered which town, who was the commanding officer, what was the date, how many people they killed, the different categories, Jews, gypsies, communist functionaries, and others. Uh, so uh, we had these daily reports. I personally totaled them to add up to over a million people. At that point, I said, that's enough. I flew from Berlin, where we did our research, down to General Taylor, who was my chief of counsel at that time. He was Paulo Justice Jackson for 12 subsequent trials. Very fine lawyer from Harvard. And uh, <laughs> we were later law partners <laughs> before we became a professor at Columbia <laughs> at Cardozo. Anyway, he appointed me the chief prosecutor in the, what was known as the Einsatzgruppen trial. Nobody, of course, could pronounce it or translate it. But these were special extermination squads, and their job was to do as Whitney has described. Their assignment was go and kill all the Jews, men, women, and children. Wipe them out. Extirpate them. We couldn't find the right translation. 
of the German language for it. And I think one point which is worth noting is in the examination on trial of Hollendorf and 22 of his colleagues uh, for the mass murder of over a million people, Hollendorf was asked to explain why did he do that? Because it's important to understand, Hollendorf was an intelligent man. Most of my defendants were doctor, had doctor's degrees. I had six SS generals in the dock, no enlisted men. Uh, and why did they do that? And he said it was self-defense. What do you mean self-defense? Nobody attacked Germany. Germany attacked all the other countries all around them, France, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Poland, Russia. Uh, well, he said, we knew that the Russians, the Soviets, were planning to attack us. Well, why did you kill all the Jews? Well, we knew that the Jews were sympathetic to the Bolsheviks. Therefore, you have to kill them all. And why do you kill the children? The question to which uh, Whitney referred. And the explanation was, well, look, if you're going to eliminate, they never used the term kill, if you're going to eliminate the parents, then of course the children would grow up and be enemies of the state. And we were interested in long-term security. So we have to kill them too. It's very logical. Now, my units used the gas vans, which Whitney described the documents that he first led him to the trail, this SS officer Becker. Uh, I got the details of that. Oldendorf didn't like them. They were not very good. You could only jam in a certain number of people, usually the aged who couldn't walk, or the children who couldn't roll and they couldn't chase them out into the woods, so they had to throw them into a vehicle. They throw them into the gas vans, close the door, and the plan was when they get to their destination about 20 minutes away, a ditch somewhere, they would just dump them like you dump the garbage. But Ollendorf complained that sometimes there were some of them still alive. And it was terrible. His men had to unload them by hand. And they were bloody from scratching and screaming and feces and urine. And he said, this was very hard on my men. So Ollendorf was really a very humane sort of guy. Uh, he was sentenced to death and hanged in Landsberg Prison. It takes eight minutes to die before you get that certificate after you've been dropped. However, enough of that. Uh, I mention this only because I see the picture in its goriest details. And I, of course, have been traumatized by that experience. And I'm trying to do, as Henry and many others, you here as well, Jackson Center, I'm sure, as well, trying to change the world, trying to eliminate that kind of behavior. Well, how do you go about doing that? And it's very easy to be discouraged. You hear all the complaints, how difficult it is, you need a budget, you have to have an approval, you have to have judges, you have to have this, you have to have that. But I take a long-term view. Uh, even though I'm somewhat younger than my colleagues here, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the long-term view is I see enormous progress. I am terribly optimistic. And they say, how can you be optimistic? It's like when people ask me personally, how do you feel? I say, I'm always feeling fine. But how can you always be fine? I said, it's very easy. I'm aware of the alternatives. And that's the same with the experience we've had here with the courts. When I went to school at Harvard, I don't know how it was at Yale, certainly not, they didn't <laughs> teach international criminal law. There was no such thing as international criminal law. It didn't exist. When I first began to campaign for an international criminal court, inspired by Jackson and by Delpha Taylor, because if you have international crimes, it's logical that you need a court in order to deal with it. And that's what the first General Assembly of the United Nations decided. They passed resolution saying, we approve the Nuremberg Principles and the judgment of the International Military Tribunal, and we want to set up committees to draft a new code of crimes, uh, of international crimes, and the establishment of a court. They referred also to genocide, which was not in the statute of the International Military Tribunal or the subsequent trials, but they referred to them specifically as part of the tribute to Raphael Lemkin, who was also working there, uh, pushing the, lobbying the UN on that. So we had instructions then to follow the Nuremberg precedent. And what happened? They set up committees. By the time I got interested in this, I began to sit in on all those committees. 
in no official capacity. I had a big advantage over everybody there. Nobody could fire me because nobody hired me. And I could speak the truth. And I began to write articles and books and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, believe it or not, after at least 50 years of personal effort, about 60 years from Jackson's effort, we do have an international criminal court. And that is quite a remarkable thing. Both of these gentlemen were in Rome. He was sitting next to me for a while. Henry, I never did find. But uh, he was eating pizza somewhere, I guess. Um, there's no pizza in Rome. <laughs> uh, we do have an international criminal court. And they had about a 1,000 points in dispute before they went to Rome. They bracketed them in the To reach agreement on that was very remarkable. The only thing they couldn't reach agreement on was the crime of aggression. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But first, because that's too important to just pass it by, particularly since Professor Newton has raised certain questions about it. So we had this growth in international courts. Unbelievable. First, you had the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, created by the Security Council itself, by the United Nations. 10,000 women had to be raped before we woke up to that. Then we had 800,000 people butchered in Rwanda, a disgrace to our whole world society that after the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, to allow that to happen again in Africa in a more intensely in two months, to, I think it was two years total, they killed 800,000 people, black people killing black people with machetes. You didn't need nuclear weapons and so on. So, but we had a court. We set up a court as an answer to that. And then we set up the other courts. You've heard about Cambodia, Sierra Leone. And then you've gathered here together those gentlemen who are now responsible for prosecuting some of the people who are involved in those crimes. Let me add another note, which is often overlooked. None of these war crimes trials ever intended or would be capable of doing complete justice. We did not try all the criminals. We had a small sampling only. In the Einsatzgruppen trial, for example, which I know best, there were 3,000 men in the four different units of the Einsatzgruppen. Every day they went out and their assignment was to kill Jews and others. And they did that for about two years and they reported on it. 3,000 men did that directly on either sh the shooters, as they were called, lined up 10 in a row and they would shoot people as they pushed them into the ditch, stripped them first. How many did we try? 22. 22? How come you try 22? You got 3,000 mass murderers on your hand. Well, the ridiculous answer is, we only had 22 seats in the dock. Ridiculous? Sure. Absolutely ridiculous. We weren't trying to do more. We couldn't. We were under pressure to move quickly. Uh, if we tried to try 3,000 people, we'd still be sitting in Nuremberg with probably not more convictions than we got in that one case because it petered out as time went by. So none of the war crimes trials can do more than just a sampling of uh, some of the leaders who are top, resp top responsibility for the crime. If we succeed in doing that and creating a historical record, we will have made great achievements. We will have shown the victims that we know and we care about what happened to them. We had a very interesting address. Some of you may not have been here. Uh, and Lucy Reed, the new president of the American Society of International Law, referred to the fact that we now have for the first time in a criminal statute a provision that the victims are entitled to compensation for their injuries as well as representation during the course of the trial. The details of that have still to be worked out. There will be enormous difficulties. But the fact is, that's another step forward. And I'd like to look at the alternatives and the progress. And when I look at it just from the point of view of courts, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. When I started working on it, they said, Benny, you must be crazy. You're never going to get this kind of courts. I said, I know that, but I'm going to try. And lo and behold, unfortunately, the tragedies came along, which stimulated the creation of the courts. And I hope we will be able to go further without waiting for tragedy. And we'll follow Jackson's advice, the greatest tribute that power has ever paid to reason 
was to subject their enemies to the judgment of the law. Okay, but there are other things, because in order to succeed, we have to change the way people think. You heard what Ollendorf thought. He thought it was defense to go out and kill somebody who you believe might attack you first. A preemptive strike. The United States government in the trial of U.S. versus Ollendorf held that that was no justification and that it was an international crime and that it was punishable by death. And he was hanged together with a number of his colleagues. Have we learned much? Well, we don't have courts to deal with it. Well, we've got to change the way people think. But you know, a lot of people think that way. And they still think that way and always thought that way. If you look at your historical record, there have always been those who believed only in power, in war. Bismarck, General von Moltke's big correspondence on that issue. And uh, there are those who say, look, if you've got the power, use it. It's the only thing that counts. The rest of it is talk. And if you've got the weapons and they haven't, kill them. Well, that has been the history of mankind. The history of mankind is written in the history of warfare. But it's getting to be very dangerous. Nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, you know, we can kill everybody several times over. When are we gonna start to change the way people think? It's enough to frighten you, except if you're like me, you look at the alternatives, you see the progress. We've made enormous progress there too. I look in the audience here, I'm glad to see some black people here because we had a time in this country not long ago, 150 years ago or so, where white people thought it was perfectly legitimate for them to own black people because our economy depended on it. They picked the cotton, towed that bale, etc. cetera. Uh, and so we had slavery and we had the emancipation finally. Today, nobody talks about slavery in the United States or in most other countries of the world. We also had the emancipation of women. Our constitution didn't give them the right to own property or to vote. Now we're lucky if a man can get on the bench. <laughs> the first six judges elected to the International Criminal Court were women. <laughs> I was watching this on my computer screen in Florida and I said, my God, they're not gonna let a man on the court. <laughs> so, but these are signs of, of great progress. Uh, we have also the very fact that we can call this the international humanitarian law dialogue. There was no such thing as humanitarian law. It didn't exist. You had, you know, human rights, people talked about it, but to have something organized, to have a genocide convention, took 40 years to persuade the United States to ratify it subject to all kinds of conditions. That's a reflection of what I have told you. There are people, good people of good intention, who see things differently. They think it's glorious to march and die for your country. I think I'd rather have them live for their country. But it's a point of view, and that point of view still exists. Uh, now, let me touch on that in connection with aggression. I have devoted, since the creation of the International Criminal Court, to only one topic. I'm getting on in years, not as old as Henry, but <laughs> I thought I can't focus on everything. I did for a while focus on everything. I know improving the United Nations disarmament, uh, uh, having a review conference for the UN Charter, uh, an international military force, all the things we were supposed to do in order to have a more peaceful world, and I'm focusing on the crime of aggression. This was debated, and I sat through the debates for about 30 years. Remember, Jackson said the most important accomplishment in his life, and Telford Taylor echoed the same, and John Barrett is the expert on that, was to condemn what had been a national right and make it an international crime, and that was aggressive war. And the arrangement made was that the use of armed force was prohibited by the United Nations Charter, which binds all nations, including the United States, except if the Security Council authorizes it or in defense against an immediate armed attack 
uh, and then only until the council can intervene. That was the rules of the game. Despite that, aggressions have been committed in many places and are being committed as we speak. So it seemed to me important to try to carry out the sense of what Jackson and Telford Taylor and the other courts that worked on this in those days meant. And my motivation is not to diminish the United States, on the contrary. My motivation is to save the lives of all those poor guys like me and the girls now who go out and will be killed. Mostly we kill civilians in war these days, you know. I want to save their life. Uh, I've seen what it means. And I don't know how to do that, except trying to prevent war making. If we could prevent war making, how would the world look? Imagine if we'd had an international criminal court in existence before the first Iraq war. And we were on the outskirts of Baghdad, and we told General Schwarzkopf, go in and, and arrest the criminal who's responsible for attacking a friendly neighboring Arab state and going into Kuwait, clear act of aggression, co accompanied as all such acts are by crimes against humanity and war crimes. Arrest him, put him on trial, sentence him. What would the world look like today if we had done that? We'd have had no Iraq war. We would have saved thousands of lives. We would have saved billions of dollars. And we could have found an authorization in the Security Council resolution which says, go in and expel them, the aggressor from the country he's invaded, and restore peace in the area. That would have been this clause, which you'd have to stretch a bit, because they didn't have in mind to put him on trial, but to stretch it a bit and put him on trial. Uh, it's better than stretching him a bit, stretching the charter a bit by ignoring the Security Council, because that undermines the rule of law. And when you start to undermine it, you don't know who's going to undermine it next. So uh, it's a dangerous situation. And let me conclude because uh, uh, I would say that law has been evolving very slowly. It's an evolving process. International law recently came on the scene relatively. It's like a newborn babe. It cannot function. It needs help. It needs training, it needs experience, it has to be nurtured. It is moving in the right direction. Certainly it is moving in the right direction. And we must not be discouraged by the little incidents that come up or the differences of opinion among people of goodwill. Differences of opinion are natural in a democracy. America is a great democracy. It's not a country where you expect one opinion. You expect many opinions. What you have to do as rational people is to weigh the alternatives and say which way is it better, not only for us, but for all the rest of the world. We must begin to have what I call planetary thinking. That you recognize that we are all inhabitants of one small planet. We must share the resources on this planet so that everyone on it can live in peace and human dignity. And it can be done. Don't tell me it can't be done because it has never been done before. Nothing that is new was ever done before. If we can go to the moon, spend a billion dollars or whatever it cost us to get there, and come back with a bucket of dirt and consider it a great victory, why can't we arrange a system whereby you settle your disputes by peaceful means as required by law today? Why can't we do that? There's no good reason for that. We can fly airplanes which have 10,000 of parts in them, and if any one part is defective, the plane will crash. But we fly the planes, and they do fly. And we have the blackberries and the blueberries and all that stuff in our pocket, and we can speak to the world. You know, these miracles of accomplishment. And we have to let women be raped in Darfur. We have to let the African people starve to death. Why? I don't believe that's beyond human capacity. You need to generate the political will without waiting before you have to kill another few hundred million people. So. <laughs> Basically, on that happy note, <laughs> uh, I say we are making good progress, and even if we weren't, even if the progress is slow and difficult, I think we have an obligation, moral obligation, to those who have perished, to those who are still in the military, where's my friend Mr. Newton there, uh, who are speaking for the military, and for those who are yet to come, to try to make this a more humane, and civil world under a rule of law. 
And if we all set our minds to it, I'm confident. I may be around to see it, but uh, I'm confident it can be done. So I wish you luck. Thank you.